In the last video, we were looking at how to find a local maximum or a minimum on a graph. If I go back here, we can see like in this graph right here, this is a local maximum, there's a local minimum, and a local maximum. The key feature was this. I mean, this was the steps. How do we find it? Well, we find where the derivative is equal to zero, and then we have to use a sign diagram to check that the derivative changes sign when you go left or right of that point. So let's do an example. I think that'll really help here. So find the coordinates of any local max or minimum, remember maximum values or minimum values for this equation, y equals x cubed minus 3x plus 4. So I want to know the x and y coordinates for whatever the max or min is. Now my goal is to do this without needing a calculator. I want to do it by just, just doing the math here. I'll show you later on, we can actually show this with a calculator as well. But the goal is to do this, you know, we don't need a calculator for everything, we can do this ourselves. So, very first step is to go back here and say, well, step one, find where f primed is equal to zero. Well, I guess the first step then is to find the derivative. That's what f primed means. So, my step one, you know, I want to set f primed equal to zero. I want to find out where that happens. So in this case, I don't have f primed, it's going to be y primed, and that's okay though. So maybe we'll just find y primed for starters. I need to find my derivative. Now I've given you, uh, purposefully, I've given you an easy example. This could be as gross of an equation as you want, but the idea is the same. Just take the derivative, set it equal to zero, and see what happens. So in this case, I have x cubed originally. My derivative then becomes, well, the 3 comes in front, so 3 times x, and it becomes, well, 3 minus 2. 1 is just 2. So 3x squared. And again, we have a negative here, negative 3. Turns out there was a 1 on top here. The 1 times negative 3 just makes it negative 3. And x to the power of, well, 1 minus 1 gives me x to the 0, which means it disappears. So it's just this. And then the derivative of a constant is just, it goes poof, it disappears. So this is y primed at any point. Right? This tells me what my derivative is at any x value. Now, I don't care about that, though. I want to find where my derivative is equal to 0. So what I do then is, after I've found my derivative at every point, I set it equal to 0. So 0 equals 3x squared minus 3. And then I just find out what x values make that happen. So in this case, let's see. Hmm. I could. There's a number of ways of doing this. I could actually factor this. Yeah, actually, that's maybe a good way to do it. I could try factoring this. I could take out uh, a 3 from both of these. So I could say 3 times it'd be x squared minus 1. If you're ever not sure, just try multiplying it again. 3 times x squared is 3x squared. 3 times negative 1, negative 3. And if I really wanted to, then I could take a look at this, and I could recognize this as something that factors as what's called a difference of squares. If I have like a squared minus b squared, it's the same thing as saying a plus b times a minus b. It's just one of these identities. It's called difference of squares. So I'm going to use that property here. Or well, this I have, it's like x squared minus 1 squared. So it becomes, you know, x plus 1, x minus 1. That's a way to look at it at least. And I can see then that I have two x values that make this work. So if you look at this, the idea then is, is to try to find out what x values make this happen. So I've got a 3 here just hanging out. Well, I can't change x to do anything with a 3. So the 3 always hangs out. But the idea is if I can make this little thing right here be 0, well, 3 times 0 times anything is still going to work. It's still going to give me 0. So what value of x makes this thing 0? You could always do it off to the side, so x plus 1 equals 0 and solve for it. But hopefully you'll see that x equals negative, whoops, x equals negative 1. That should work. Because if I put in a negative 1 here, negative 1 plus 1 would give me 0. 0 times 3 times anything gives me 0. It would work. There's another value of x, though, that would work. How about over here? What value of x would make this thing 0? Well, x equals positive 1 would work. Now, I know what you're thinking, maybe you're thinking, why in the world did he do any factoring here? Why did he do that? Why not just use the algebra to solve? You could have. I'll just show you off to the side how you would do that. Let's say I did 0 equals 3x squared minus 3. I could try to get x by itself, so I'd move my minus 3 over to the left, so I'd have 3 equals 3x squared. Then I would say, well, I want to divide, I mean, I want to get rid of this 3, so I would divide both sides by that. So 3 divided by 3 would give me 1, so 1 would equal x squared. 
And then you could say, well, then I want to get x by itself. To, so I take the square root of both sides. So I'd say then x equals, therefore, now you have to be very careful here. This is the key thing where it's easy to make a mistake. A lot of students would just say x equals 1. Now that works, but you have to remember this rule here. When you take the square root of something, it's technically you know, plus or minus the square root of that thing. Now square root of 1 is just 1, so that would mean x would be plus or minus 1. And what does that mean? That means x is plus 1 and x is minus 1. So you see, although it looks like I've done it in a different way, it's actually the same thing. Math is all about, you know, there's lots of different ways of doing things, but, you know, this is the answer here. So if you decided to just do it algebraically, you could have. Just be very careful when you take your square root. It's technically plus or minus. That's because you could take a plus 1 and square it and get 1. But if you take a minus 1 and square it, a negative squared still gives you a positive. So that's why you could have plus 1 or negative 1 here. And they both squared to give you one. Or you could have factored it and seen this. But you had to remember, first of all, uh, to take out the three first. And then you had to recognize this as a difference of squares or whatever. In any case, I've got my answer here. I'm just going to actually delete this uh, last part right here. I'm just going to get rid of that. There we go. So I've done step one. I've found where is my derivative equal to zero. I've got two spots. I've got x equals negative 1 and x equals 1. So step 1 is done here where I should find where f prime of x equals 0. Awesome. Well, now I have to do step 2, though. And step 2 is all about a, whoops, I'll go back here, use a sine diagram. So I'll show you, I think it'll help now to look at just doing the sine diagram here. So what I'll do is I'll extend the page a little bit here. Go. So I'm going to do step two now. That's a sine diagram. So what I need to do here, the way we do a sine diagram, or at least a way to do it, is draw just a number line. All, I don't care about the heights. I just care about what x value is. So I just draw x. Now I need to look at these key points here. So I'm going to draw first of all where 0 is. But I don't really care about that. I want to know, well, when I'm at plus 1 here, and I'm looking at this, I'm going to draw a little dotted line here just to tell me I'm interested in this point, and I'm interested in this one, at plus 1 and minus 1. So I'm interested in looking here and here. Now what I want to do then is look to the left or to the right, what will the derivative be? So I'm going to just say deriv, just for short, that just tells me right here, I'm going to be looking over here, I'm going to be looking if the derivative is positive or negative at this point here. Actually, I'm going to need more room. So I'm going to take this little derivative and move it a little bit further here, like this. Now what I'm going to do is take a look at this value and see if I can figure something out here. So let's look at this. We need to know, first of all, what our derivative is. The derivative is, in general, it's just, um, well, I could say derivative is this. I could say it's 3 times x plus 1 times x minus 1. That's one way to write the derivative. Now the reason I do this is because now I can take a look at this point. I know the derivative is 0 at this point, but that's not what I care about. My whole goal, if I go back a step here, um, is actually to say this and to try to take a look at, well, I want to find the place where, you know, where I look to the left or to the right of this, whoops, of this point right here. I want to go left or right of that point and see if the derivative is positive and then negative, or if it's negative, then positive, or maybe it doesn't change sign. But in this case right here, whoops, there we go. So in this case, what I want to do is take a look at this and look to the left of this point. So negative 1. If I go to the left of it, I'm at some number left of negative 1. So I could make this arbitrarily, I can consider it as maybe negative 2. So now just imagine in your head you have a negative 2 you're looking at here. Well, I've got three things multiplied together, and I just care about if it's positive or negative. I actually don't care about the value. I just care about if it's positive or negative. Well, 3 is always a positive, so it's a positive, times, well, if this is negative 2, negative 2 plus 1 will give me a negative value. So it's going to be some negative value times, now negative 2 minus 1 will also give me a negative so a, a positive times a negative times a negative. Well, if you remember, negative times negative gives you a positive. Positive times a positive is a positive. So that means it's going to go from an increasing function to the left of this point. And we'll do the same thing over here. 
So what if I want to the right of negative one? Well, I could actually make it zero, that would work. So let's consider x is zero here. Well, I still have a three. I always have this three here. Now if x was zero, zero plus one gives me a positive value. And zero minus one gives me a negative value. Positive times a positive times a negative gives me a negative. Awesome. Well, now I can consider this point and even just to the right of it. So what if I make something to the right of one? It could be anything. Let's just say I make it two. Well, I've still got three in front here. So I've still got a positive. If I put in a two here, two plus one gives me three. So that's positive. And two minus one, well, that's gonna be positive as well. Positive times a positive times a positive gives me a positive. What this essentially does you know, this tells me about the derivative. The derivative is positive, which means, you know, the shape of the graph does something like this, you know, at this. Over here, the shape of the graph goes something like this. So hopefully it makes sense if it goes from a positive slope to a negative slope. That means this thing right here is a maximum. So now I can conclude that x equals minus 1 is a max. And I can do the same thing here of this point to the left of it, it went negative slope. To the right of it, it went positive slope. That's what this means. It went from a negative to a positive. That means this is a minimum. So that means I know that x equals one is a minimum. Now they wanted the coordinates of this point. So I have to go a little bit further. I have to plug in when x equals negative one, what do I get? Well, negative one cubed is I need to know the y value. So when negative one, let's see, I cube that, uh, what will I get? Well, let's see, I will get, um, that'll be negative one minus negative three. So that'll actually be plus three, plus four. So that'll be seven, seven minus one will be six. So that means, you can just take your time and do it though, but if you wanna really get the answer, then we can do it. We can say, therefore, we'll say, uh, x equals negative one and y equals six, that is a local maximum. And in the same way, we can do it with x equals one. So if x is positive one, let's see here now. I take a positive one, one cubed is one, minus three times one, that's gonna be one minus three, that'll give me negative two, and negative two plus four is, uh, well, just two. So that means then I can say that this is one comma two. That is a local minimum. So this is my conclusion here. I can say I found that, you know, the local max and the local min. Now, maybe I want to actually graph this. So I can actually do the same thing here. I can actually show you just what the graph looks like. Let me just get the equation here and I'll get my trusty calculator out. And I'm going to, yeah, I'll put it over here so we can see it. So I'm gonna press Y equals here. And I'm gonna say, well, I want X, um, I want X to the power of three. And I want that, I wanna do minus three X. I wanna say plus four. So I expect it to have a one max and one min. Hey, look at that. I bet that the x value right here, this looks like the maximum is at negative one. What did we say the maximum should be? Look down here. x equals negative one should be the local maximum. Is it? Sure is, look at this. This is just to show you that this is pretty powerful. We found x equals negative one was a local maximum here. And x equals positive one, that's over here, that was a local min. If you really want to see it, I can actually do calc here. I can do this little blue one. So I'm going to go second to get to calc here. And I'm actually, I could do min and max. I could do it that way. But just to show you um, that we did it right, we can do this and say value. What I like to do about value is that's if I already know what the y value should be. So if I say x equals one, then y should be two. And it is. And furthermore, it looks like it's at the minimum point. So that really works. And if I just type in negative one, it's going to ask, that's going to assume that I want the x value of negative one, and it'll tell me that the y value is six. And if you look at it, it corresponds to the maximum. So without even graphing it, we could actually figure this out. Now it may sound like it's long and a little bit time consuming, and it kind of is, but I think it's really important and it's really helpful. So the key is step one, find where your derivative is zero. Step two, check that the derivative changes sign left or right.